Welcome everybody to Learn With LOL. Today we're joined with Sam. He's the co-founder with his wife, which we were just talking about. It's pretty cool. Co-founder of Lawira. He's here to talk about psychedelics and mental health to fit into a series I've been doing for millennials and millennial benefit. He is millennial. He even looked uh, that up earlier today. Sam, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Lawa. Thank you for having me. Um, regard, I, I want to start with a quick question. Uh, if, if, I, if I started the retreat with my wife, I always thought that I was a founder and she was a co-founder because it was my idea. Or, or are we both co-founders? So maybe you can clear, clear this out for me. Uh, you could go co-founders. You could just say founders. It mm -hmm. ultimately it doesn't matter. It's what you both agree on. You both, you could like I, I found I co-founded a couple things with different people, and we all just call ourselves founders. Some people don't like okay. co-founder because it has like a diminutive type status. If one's a founder, yeah. and one's a co-founder, it does have a diminutive type feeling to it. I would just call you, both of you guys founders and say, hey, you found it together yeah. like that. Okay. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then the founders of uh, Loira. So the, the first thing I want to uh, ask you about is, um, we were just mentioning this, so it's, uh, it's on the top of our heads, but Loira is uh, seemingly the highest rated uh, psychedelic retreat in South America, which is a big deal for a variety of reasons, one of which is there are a lot of retreats popping up. So getting to the top, having 250 you know, five star reviews is a big accomplishment. Most most businesses um, and established areas don't accomplish that, and and so I'm just kind of curious, what what set it, what set you guys apart? Like, what what do you think is like attributing people just flocking and showing that appreciation? You know, like a lot of people may love something, but they don't take the time to write a, write a review or even review something at all. Well, I believe number one thing is that we just do our work really, really well, which comes to the, the core medicine experience. Uh, and that's why people are really happy. But uh, I think uh, the the main reason is if you look around, the average ayahuasca retreat is somewhere between 1500 to uh, $3,000 uh, US. And uh, as of now, we're able to offer that experience for only 595 at any point in this conversation, if you find value in it, please subscribe. It is hugely beneficial, and it tells Google and everyone out there that this is content worth watching. Thank you for everyone thus far who has commented, liked, subscribed, and told their friends. And uh, so I guess it's that because it's it's more affordable, so we get more people. And it's kind of ties into my goals with, with the medicine because ever since I got my own healing from it and it really improved my life, I want to spread it to as many people as possible. And... I guess my main strategy is to lowering the barrier of entry when it comes to price and also, you know, the accessibility of the place and the the rules and the simplicity of preparation and all, and all those things. So I guess it, it, it has to do with both people being happy and our ability to receive a lot of people. Yeah. Is there... Is there any reason why a uh, retreat has to be three thousand versus six hundred? What you can, what you're doing? Are you, I imagine you're probably doing similar things. So, like, is there really a, a reason well, for the different price? We had people that uh, before coming to us came to Rhythmia, which I think is the most expensive retreat. It's like seven thousand a week. Wow! And they said the the core healing experience they had with us was actually better than at Rhythmia, and uh, I have it. I have it on the video. I I, uh, I got a testimonial from them, but um, of course they, the amenities are nicer. You get uh, nicer rooms and everything is a bit more fancy. It's hard for me to say because the the local economies, maybe the people have higher wages, or I could find many ways to to sort of um, explain why they could charge that much, and I'm sure they have the reasons, but. Us, uh, we just, you know, I'm constantly fighting the battle uh, to not raise the price, but also find balance where we can have a good team of people and do the improvements. But sometimes it's inevitable. But I would say at least in some cases, it's just greed. Uh, people just want to make money or maybe they have investors that gave them money and now they say, like, let's squeeze the most out of it. But um yeah, it's it's a difficult balance for somebody to be a business owner and a spiritual person trying to help other people. Like it's it's the most difficult one I've ever found in in my personal life. So I don't want to judge those people that charge a lot of money. I I don't want to be that guy, but uh, I also don't want to charge that much. Uh, so yeah, well, I think it's also a testament to what you just said, Lev. If you're 
the core healing experience, which is essentially what people go to a retreat like yours, an ayahuasca retreat or other type of psychedelic, is to have that type of experience. Is it if it's as good or better than those other ones? I think that's a, a kind of a mark to your dedication. What um, I don't know if it's possible like to know why one would be better than the other. I haven't been on a retreat, so what do you think makes yours so uh, so powerful? At like the core um, element that the person mentioned. Well, I'd say it's a good information to have uh, for people that uh, that are choosing retreats and let's say even if they don't want to come to ours. I think the 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 core the core things that we rely on is uh, relying on tradition. So uh, our shaman is uh, he's an indigenous person that comes from a lineage of shamans, meaning his dad was a shaman, his dad's dad was a shaman, which is like a gold standard when it comes to choosing choosing uh, shamans. Then um, he growth, grows his own medicine. He originally comes from the Amazon. He also cooks his own medicine. And each part of those steps in preparation, they have a, a ceremony. So it will be very different if you have somebody who maybe only recently started working with the medicine and then they go buy ayahuasca bottle in some black marketplace and then they give it to you as opposed to a somebody who has been trained in it with a tradition and is actually like uh, growing and harvesting their own ayahuasca sustainably another thing is uh, fo- uh when, when choosing a retreat as well is the focus on integration like how much does a retreat care about your life after the retreat and how which tools do they provide for you to integrate the experience and not just have uh, this beautiful dream and and a short term release just for you to feel like oh you need to go back to to drink ayahuasca just to feel better again two months later I mean it's it's great for business right but it's not not optimal for for people and their their well being um, those are the first that come to mind and. Yeah. Um, the good team of facilitators, like a uh, uh, team with uh, uh, plenty of people to make sure that everyone is feeling well, everyone is protected physically, and nobody wanders off, you know, into the jungle. We're not really in the jungle, we're in the countryside, but still there's places, you know, you can fall or, like, hurt yourself. So that's that's also important. Mm-hmm. I also think that uh, the integration aspect sounds really important the there's that that belief in america where it's like why cure something where we can treat it you know for the rest of your lives but if you do a great job then that person is going to tell someone that person is going to tell someone and just will get a lot more volume that way and a lot more better uh, betterment so it sounds like um the best business thing actually is just to take care of people to the level that you want to i'm curious in terms of the the shaman growing and harvesting and making the ayahuasca is that is that something that's like on the ground? So it's like like something that you like provide the space for for them to do, or is that like something they do on their own and they bring it in, ready for like the retreat? No, unfortunately, we don't grow on, grow our, our own ayahuasca. The climate would not allow for it. Uh, we're mm-hmm. at about thousand five hundred meters above the sea level. That's like perfect weather for to grow coffee. There's a lot of coffee farms in the region. Ayahuasca needs to be much lower uh, where it's hotter. Uh, it would grow here, but it would. It normally takes about eight, eight years for a ayahuasca vine to mature for you to harvest wow. it. Here, it would take it 15, 20 years. So if I would start with planting my own ayahuasca here, we would only open a retreat uh, 20 years from now. <laughs> it would be late. So they grow they grow their their ayahuasca in the jungle. It's um, it's it's uh, And it's an area called Putumajo. It's on a border between Ecuador and Colombia. And uh, they cook it there and then bring it bring it here in a ready form how much space does do they need to grow enough ayahuasca to service your retreat i grew up on a farm so like i think in these these ways i don't know yeah. if other people might not care i, I just always am curious about these things do you think in in hectares or in acres they're this i know what they are so either way is fine okay. for me. so um i think the minimum amount for like one shaman to be able to give ayahuasca to maybe 50 to 100 people a month it probably would be about five hectares which i think is mm. about 10 acres That's not and bad. uh and and uh my shaman and his dad they have a uh, they have 50 he- 50 hectares which is about 100 acres mm-hmm. and it's not like it's a farm where everything is cut out it's actually a a, a young forest because each ayahuasca vine to grow requires a tree to grow around and and loop up and they they grow they grow about four 
ayahuasca plants around each tree. So so it's kind of like a like a like a jungle ish slash like a low forest type situation where they grow the vines. That sounds really beautiful. The just the image of it. I, I can kind of imagine something of what it looks like. I haven't been to South America yet. It is on my list. Now that I've met you, I'll like swing through Colombia and say hi and see these places. Um as, as long as I'm allowed, I guess. But um yeah, that sounds all, really all cool. This, but... th- this entire podcast episode is just me uh, convincing you to come to our retreat. <laughs> just you. Yeah, my just just me. <laughs> uh, yeah. but yeah, it sounds beautiful. The the I guess it would go against the idea of, of growing the ayahuasca in any other way than traditional. I was thinking like could you grow it in a greenhouse or something and then have it at your altitude? But I imagine like the whole idea of it is just to do it the right way. No, you definitely can. Even here, you can just grow it. It just mm. takes more time. You can do, but it's 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 a, it's not a small thing. Like you would have to have a big uh, big greenhouse, and uh, you can uh, you can do it. But it's um, it even grows in the wild. You know, the, that's how they they used to do it, uh, just harvesting in the wild. But now it is at least here in Colombia, it is pretty sustainable. Every shaman has a little plot of uh, land or forest where they grow it, and uh, I I have planted a couple plants at, at another property that I have, which is much smaller, but in a warmer climate. Uh, but I I don't think uh, I need to go back to check whether they they grew or not. But it's um it's a it's a pretty looking plant. It has flowers as well when it flowers. Mm-hmm. yeah um so the the shaman maintains about 50 to 100 acres but you don't need that much to have a retreat like yours which services about 50 to 100 people a month um and you started this i think it's only been about three years since you've been doing it and it's been about growing pretty steadily two and a half yeah yeah um has it been steady at 50 to 100 the whole time or is your or is it slowly incrementally getting bigger so that you can reach the point where like are you going towards a vision essentially is what i'm asking yeah so we started about two and a half years ago it was just uh, a one ceremony a month uh type thing where it was mostly just about me wanting to drink medicine from my house and bringing in a couple people that we knew then it went to becoming one weekend a month and then one week a month and I think about a year and maybe two months ago, we, we, we went to doing two weeks. And maybe seven months ago, we, we went to doing two weeks plus a long weekend, four day. So as of now, we're doing 18 days in every month and uh, they're filling up pretty quickly. So I think soon enough, we'll have to do three weeks a month. And we'll keep increasing that till I burn out and... <laughs> Or I need I need a strategy for what to do after, because the the resting time is getting less and less every time. Uh, it is a very difficult uh, job to do. I do have a good team of, um, of facilitators, but uh, yeah, I'm definitely gonna have to start uh, building like two separate teams so that they can replace each other. Because then otherwise it would become very difficult for the shaman as well uh, to to work that much time because he also needs time to go back and tend to his garden and uh, the team of people that works that garden because as you can imagine uh, 50 hectares are not gonna um, uh, harvest themselves and control themselves uh, by themselves yeah yeah I, I was imagining the the his their farm to be flat but it also could be quite mountainous to go around like for anyone imagining if you play if you watch sports like a, a, fo- a football field is about an acre. So we're talking mm-hmm. like a, a lot of football fields. Like the imagine the biggest stadium I've ever seen is bigger than that in terms of like the the, sp- the footprint. Um, mm. I, I was just thinking like maybe there could be like an upsell where like people after they've done the retreat, they go and like help out with the plants as a way to like give back mm-hmm. the plants more or something. I think that'd be fun. But um, the, in terms of parallelism, one, that, go ahead. The, there's one retreat in Ecuador that has this great idea. And I, I even reached out to the owner and said like, this is genius. Uh, there is like... Um, a program where every person that comes to the retreat donates some small amount of money, like ten dollars or something like that, and they use that money to plant a vine to his name, basically, like that's his vine. And then he comes mm-hmm. back a few years later. Uh, you know, you can uh, ayahuasca vine can be ready to consume and be after sometimes after two years. You know, eight years is like the optimal, but um, so you can then come back and be like, yeah, let's make ayahuasca from my vine. 
and it's it's genius because not only people feel that they're they're supporting but also you you can create so much more vines and you mentioned the size of the properties it's not because they uh, my shaman and his dad need um, this huge uh, amount of ayahuasca now it's 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 uh, we're kind of preparing for all the people that are going to come uh, soon enough uh, as as the word uh, gets out there because um yeah i kind of feel that there will be a big wave of people that will need this healing because um the statistics is that uh 25 to 30 percent of people in the world are uh, depressed or yeah. have anxiety or some kind of you know sort of slow burning mental illness and um only as of now less than one percent of um people in the world have had ayahuasca and when they do they really get relief from those uh from those uh conditions so we're kind of looking at close to 30 percent of people that need to come here and actually get the relief and the only reason they're not here now is because they just don't know about it or maybe they think ayahuasca is a drug or maybe they think it's not safe and i guess uh i'm my biggest uh, job is to disprove it and explain that it is possible. That's why we collect a lot of video reviews from people mm -hmm. that just done the retreat. And because I, I believe that the more people, uh, other people can see that got the healing and see their happy faces, the less fear they have. Because what stops most people from trying that healing modality is fear. You know, you hear a lot yeah. of crazy stories. Yeah, I think, well, to your point about uh, the need, the I think SR, SSRIs are in the United States, just looking at the United States because I'm familiar with it, the United States is the largest prescriber of SSRIs in the world, like by a large one. It's like three or four times as much as anything else. Um, and they, I mean, they do what they're, they're designed to do. I'm really been excited seeing all the psychedelic research that's been coming out and how they're slowly becoming medicinal in the United States, um, like psilocybin, mm -hmm. et cetera. It's been like rigorously tested and shown that like some of the bigger things, like I just think if you can help these like PTSD war veterans, help with with their ptsd like imagine like anxiety and yeah. all these other things going on so i think the there's a wave changing and there is a lot of mental illness and there's a lot of fear going on in the world and the, you know the media and everything has got, got maybe a hand in there too yeah. and so stuff like what you're building and you're working on is yeah it's gonna be very needed if anything it's like you could you could probably expand like 20 30 percent every year and i bet you'd probably meet demand every every year because i think there's gonna be a lot of people who want the right type of help and the science is coming to back it up, which is great too. So it's like you got the mm -hmm. got the medicine and history of it that's been used for I think five thousand years or more. Um, yeah. And then you have the researchers now to you know sh learning like, hey, why does this even work? Why, why is it that way and stuff like that? Which I think is really cool. It, it's coming, you know, the psychedelic renaissance, as they call mm -hmm. it, is is coming. You can you can feel it. And you mentioned PTSD and you mentioned um, SSRIs, so. We have a lot of veterans that come through at least uh, every group we have at least on average one veteran so i am also slowly preparing a lot of information for the veteran program we are planning to when when we can we're planning to launch a veteran program where we will do a retreat especially for veterans and it's it's mostly for them because they would be much more comfortable uh, sharing and also for other people because some people might not necessarily like to be in the vicinity of uh, like a you know you can say trained killers losing control uh it's it's a bit tricky so the the statistics is that 22 veterans uh kill themselves every day mm -hmm. and uh, our plan was to do retreats where we'd, we would host 22 veterans and um they would themselves uh take some days where they would uh be in in a volunteering position like helping other people in case if somebody does lose control and there's, you know, and maybe some aggression could be coming out. So, so we were thinking about that. But about SSRIs and PTSD in veterans, one veteran that we had uh, explained it the best way. He said that VA, the you know, the veteran organization, mm -hmm. they they don't care if you are happy. All they care is that you don't kill yourself and you have a job and you're a functioning person. And to the large extent the the government in the us is kind of same they don't really care if you're happy and you know you're you're fulfilling your life goals what they care for is you know you're 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 not hungry and you're not sick and you're doing your job and you're performing your role in the society and you know the big machine 
So he he said this veteran, and he's very very well spoken, and I really loved his explanation. He said that uh, SSRI is numb you down, and mm-hmm. they just uh, you know they just allow you to survive. But at never at any given point you're not happy. My own analogy with uh, with SSRIs would be: let's say you have a you cut your hand and you have this uh, wound with the pus in it, and SSRIs is like a a bondage on top of that and the painkiller. So you still have the problem there, and you're just covering it up and you're covering it up, and you don't feel pain, but it's not going to get better by itself. Whether ayahuasca is like taking all this off and making a surgery and like washing the pus out and it will hurt as hell, right? But it will heal. And, Mm -hmm. you know, to the extent where you'll get, you know, a tiny scar and you'll you'll be okay. So it's the whole system of covering the symptoms and never addressing the root trauma. I think one of the, if you talk to people suffering from different addictions and you ask them like what, was the feeling they liked from the addiction like what what kept them going back the whether it's heroin or any of the other you know alcohol or whatever the feeling that they like from what i've read and you know talked to people about is that it makes them feel numb like the like the lack of feeling is actually what they like it's like sure it feels good for a component of it or whatever but actually the feeling they like is just the complete like destruction of feeling so for whatever they're like escaping or whatever that numbness is what they they're looking for so it's interesting that ssri's which are designed to help, you know, people and stuff give the same exact feeling, which is terrible. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty yeah. excited for the psychedelics renaissance, especially with all the science stuff going behind it to, to back it up so people know it's safe and whatnot. Uh, for for ayahuasca, what made you choose ayahuasca over, I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of other psychedelics. I don't know the number. There's, pro- there's probably a lot. So why ayahuasca? Who said I chose ayahuasca? Ayahuasca chose me. It's, uh, yeah? it's not as simple. Yeah, I... Back in the day when I still thought uh, psychedelics are drugs or I thought ayahuasca was a drug, I I never tried anything. I think I tried smoking weed like a couple of times and didn't feel anything. So I was uh, definitely not a kind of person that would go and do ayahuasca or drink ayahuasca in the jungle. But I, I kind of started to get messages from people around me and hearing information everywhere. And... Even before I accepted to myself that I might have a problem mentally and I um, maybe need help, I the curiosity I guess I had was so big that even though I was afraid to do it, I still did it. So the first ever psychedelic I did, or the first ever, you know, if you call it a drug experience, was for me was ayahuasca. And after that, just things just started changing. Like everything from starting a retreat to me being where I am now has some kind of synchronicity involved. So it was never like a plan. I'm going to go to South America and start an ayahuasca retreat. It all just sort of slowly happened. And it's hard to even trace the exact moment um, it happened. So ayahuasca found me. And, you know, it's funny, like uh, when, when you get into this point of life where you start hearing about ayahuasca from everywhere, your friend just told you that and then you saw it on TV and next day, it might be somebody listening to your podcast now. They're like, wow, like uh, I keep hearing about this ayahuasca thing. It really works like this. It comes into your life and starts like knocking on your door. Like till eventually you come to the point where you, where you realize, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think I need it. I think it's time for me to do it. And then I guess that sort of goes away <laughs> that uh, the pressure. And uh, I went from being, you know, on the, on the receiving side of, um, ayahuasca messages to now myself being the the person that a lot of times people find about ayahuasca or hear about ayahuasca because of my relentless um, uh, promotion of the subject and the only reason i do it i mean there, of course i I'm, I'm interested in right i do want to have more people at my retreat but anyone who ever works with ayahuasca and gets uh, healing from it automatically becomes a marketing machine for ayahuasca just because they felt so much relief and they felt so good first in their life. They want everyone else to feel that way. And not selfishly, it's just that you want to be in the company of people that have done ayahuasca. These people, um, like every time we get a group, 
group arrives and there's different people and there's different tensions and negativity, you know, normal people. But in the end of the retreat, everyone is just so happy and light and you just, you don't want them to leave. And then they leave and we get another group of sad, angry people. Once again, we bring them to the good level and then they leave. So this is sort of sad side of my work, but I'm losing the, I'm losing the track of my thought. Mm -hmm. well, I, I was following what you're saying. The, um, are there, what are the downsides to uh, ayahuasca is there like any addiction components or anything or is it like I guess like I guess marijuana is not addicting so I, is it kind of like that in that way no well I if you'd get addicted to ayahuasca you'd be the first so because mm. ayahuasca can ayahuasca can be pleasant at the time but mostly it's a lot of work so let's say we have if we have a retreat tomorrow and, and I, I prefer to drink ayahuasca once a month because I have access to it and um but every time I try and come up with excuses not to do it because it is difficult. It is a difficult process to go through your ego dissolving, to confront difficult emotions. So you don't do it for pleasure, even though some experiences might be very pleasant where you uh, feel connected and, and afterwards you'll feel good. But, but during the ask experience itself is, is, is going to be a lot of work. So you don't see like people under the bridge uh, uh drinking ayahuasca <laughs> it's like it, it it doesn't happen there is the only addiction side of it would be if somebody goes drinks ayahuasca gets a relief from them from their symptoms and then gets a lot of messages from ayahuasca on how to improve their life but then does no homework does not act on those um you know suggestions from the from the vine goes back to their life then once again a few months later they feel depressed then they go and drink ayahuasca this does happen some people just they don't want to do the work but ayahuasca itself will eventually you'll come and it will say like why are you back like you haven't done what i told you and it's it sounds crazy when you're like who's talking to you and we don't really know if it's the the plant spirit talking to you or the god or your subconscious but there will be a moment where you'll get a terrible trip and it will just tell you like you're back too soon and uh you haven't done your homework and you know pay some respect style situation it's a very uh if you like to call it spirit it's a very um tough love kind of spirit hmm. okay so it's really the the downside is uh you have to like confront your problems that's like the, like that's kind of the, the positive and the negative of it the downside is that it will cost you time and money. You'll have to do the work. Mm. Uh, but that's that's probably about it. Because uh, also during the retreat, you'll you'll sacrifice some some of your sleep and maybe maybe some of your comfort, especially if you go to to the jungle. But if you if you do it in, in, at a good place, a reputable retreat, if the medicine they they give you is, is safe, if they give you good preparation and you follow it, it is a it is a really safe thing to do so there is no real downside if let's say you have your mom and your sister have schizophrenia and, and you know you're next in line you're genetically exposed to it it can push you over and uh, make this process faster if you're borderline dying and your heart is about to stop ayahuasca can also push you over because it is it is a pretty tough um on your on your system but it's it's not tougher than running five miles so if you're if you're relatively healthy and if you follow all the instructions it's safe yeah and for for someone like yourself that you know it does it about once a month and you've been doing it for a very long time do you still are there are there still new things that you work through even after all this time or do you like reach a always. point where you like to plateau okay no always because even for me uh what i work with mostly now is when the group of people comes and they get their healing and they dump this here, I need to drink it just to get back to normal because as a, as somebody who walks in the ceremony every day and talks to people in sharing circles, you, you accumulate a lot of stuff from other people. So just from that point of view, I have to drink regularly. But my own stuff, you know, I like to, exp I like to describe my Oscar healing journey as a two steps forward, one step back process. It's not like you drink it once and your life is forever solved. You drink it, you understand some things, then you improve some things, then life happens to you, you go back a little bit. Then you might 
want to take another step. And for me, but not necessarily. Some people drink it once and they their life forever changes. And you can also, so I'm not saying like, oh, you need to drink ayahuasca regularly. You you can, if you drink ayahuasca and then you actually, you know, adopt healthy habits and you can stay in that state of being connected uh, for longer. So it's it depends on your, uh, how seriously you take it and how, how well you integrate your experience and what you actually uh, do in your life after ayahuasca. Because there is a work during ayahuasca retreat, but the real work begins after the retreat. When, you, when you're in a store and a, and a Karen comes over and starts screaming at you, this is when, you, this is when the work begins. Not, not when everyone around you is happy that, and, and, there, and you're in a green paradise of like a Colombian countryside. It's easy to be... Um, spiritual and enlightened at these conditions but how about walmart how about mm -hmm. uh traffic jam true the is there are there things that if someone's really trying to optimize for the experience in terms of uh uh like before they they came there was like i don't know, like yoga or meditation they would do for like six months if they could just really like set themselves up to get the best experience uh, what would that look like and then when they go home what does that post homework look like i think that's a, a large question so if, I guess starting like is there things that people can do um leading up to a retreat like yourself like yours to make sure they can get the most from it and prepare themselves to be in the right state so if you if you never want to go to an ayahuasca retreat then set your preparation uh timer six months before because you're likely gonna fail and then you're gonna start it again and it, it will never come to reality mm -hmm. and then you're just never gonna come so that's uh i think maybe some people can do it but if they can meditate for six months every day they might not even need ayahuasca so in in reality for a normal person and as i said what we like to do with our retreat and maybe that's why we're popular we like to lower the barrier of entry which not only means just to lower the the price it also means we don't ask for ridiculous requirements like you know for everyone to have to wear white clothes and speak spiritual lingo and only be certain type of person some things are really important you definitely have to quit ssris at least four weeks before uh, otherwise it will kill you it can it can literally cause that's called serotonin syndrome and it can hurt you so anything psychoactive medicine wise you need to quit four weeks before two weeks before you need to quit smoking weed stop drinking but when it comes to diet or habits, if you if you're gonna start meditating and journaling four weeks before, it's amazing. But if for some reason you fail for a few days, it doesn't mean that you're you cannot come. Uh, and then about a week before, you need to start preparing diet wise and not eating certain things like uh, milk products, uh, fermented foods, spicy foods. It's, it's a big list. I, I, if you ever come to the retreat, I'll send it to you. And I'm sure any other retreat operation, operators would do that as well. But some places ask you to go vegan for several months. And maybe it will enhance your experience by 1%. But it's not. it, it will just push most people away. And, and I would rather have somebody eat a burger two days before the retreat. Just because they, you know, those are depressed and anxious people you, you don't want them to you don't want to expect them to be you know at their best before they even had the healing done to them so yeah somebody might have you know misstepped and ate a burger yes but it, it only matters till the first purge and purging is a process where when you drink ayahuasca a lot of times you purge and then if you you know misstepped and did some mistake yeah your your first ceremony might your purging might be really tough but after that the rest the other three ceremonies will be okay because you'll, your system will be clean and will give you good food here at the retreat but um other things like SRI antidepressants is really important because it is potentially deadly but if let's say somebody doesn't quit uh, quit weed uh, and they still smoke it up till a few days before the retreat. It's not going to kill them, but what it will do, it will prevent them from connecting to the medicine properly and actually getting the the answers they seek. So it's kind of like wasting money. Why would you come to a retreat and not prepare properly and waste your money this way? 
Yeah, exactly. The and you mentioned uh, meditation and journaling, and I think there's a lot of different ways of doing those things online. So, what are the ones that you recommend if if you're doing it for yourself or for others? Um, is there a type of meditation that you think is really effective, or is there a method of journaling that you think is really effective? I would say mindfulness meditation, just noticing your thoughts, because it will mm. become very useful during the retreat. And journaling, just just sit down and and start writing. It uh, uh, it's not it's not to be too complicated for people that arrive to our retreat. We we provide them with a journal. It's a, it's an integration journal, so the, it has a structure to it to integrate uh, to help better integrate ceremonies. And after that, it has also like a free flow style journal. So uh, yeah, some structure might be useful, but I guess it's more applicable after after you actually have your ayahuasca experience. Mm. And then, um, why is there any like logic to like spicy food? I, I thought I felt like of all the things you list, it's like oh, spicy food is kind of like an odd one to have on there. Honestly, I don't know. I've I've read there's some pretty uh, pretty clear science on why fermented foods are not good, and I would not be able to recall it from the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But spicy food, I don't know why. It's just sometimes uh, when you come to a new tradition, all you can do is just follow the tradition, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, there, there's there's so many things you you can and cannot do, and to sort of retest them and make sure that if they're correct or not, that would be impossible. Like for example, citrus fruits or acidic foods, they will take away from the strength of your experience. But what about spicy food? I don't know. I don't really know the the real like pharma pharmacology side of the of why. I wish I knew. Yeah. Well, if so, anyone listening knows, uh, put it in the comments or email me, and I'll, I'll send it to you as well. And then we'll all Sounds learn together. Good. This and is then, how we uh, learn. Yes. Uh, you mentioned purging. So, like, when you eat, when you drink it the first time, like, you throw up, essentially? Uh, is it, like, on the, purpose? Not, ju not just the first time. It might happen a couple times through, throughout the retreat. Uh, it It is a part that people dread the most. And they, some people don't drink ayahuasca just because they don't like to throw up. Uh, strangely enough, it will, during the retreat, it will become one of your favorite parts and you get really good at throwing up. And be, it is because in, in the local tradition, they don't say to puke. They say aliviar, which means to alleviate. So literally what you're, what you're doing is sometimes you'll have a, an emotion or a thought that will come up and you will be, sort of in it and you will feel the emotion a negative emotion in the form of nausea and then when you purge or puke you'll almost feel the emotion leaving yourself so it's uh it, it is definitely something that is uh, is a part of the healing process for example if you work with mushrooms which is also a great uh, plant medicine uh, it's really rare that you puke and for some people that work with ayahuasca a lot then they work with mushrooms they they complain that it it's missing that physical moment of you know uh, allevi alleviating hmm. interesting kind of okay so it's not uh, it's, I, I, uh, it just seems interesting to me that uh it's like it causes that um and yet sometimes uh, a good thing too like people like it um what what made you choose to set up in Colombia? Maybe it's like where you first had your first experience, but like why Columbia over, I imagine, you know, there's a bunch of other options where you could uh, set up your place. No, so I, I first settled in Colombia <clears throat> before I even uh, did ayahuasca for the first time. It's just Colombia is a great country, especially this area around Medellin is like as close as it gets to actual paradise. Like they call Medellin a city of eternal spring because it's never too warm, never too hot. It's it's just lovely. So I settled here, and I I met my wife here, and then uh, it it was it was actually the beginning of our relationship. We had the we lost a our first child. We had the um, miscarriage, and I guess it was sort of one of those things that that also led me to ayahuasca that that, that trauma. So I in the beginning I didn't know there was ayahuasca in Colombia, and and the reasons for that is. First of all, it's called Jahe in Colombian uh, tradition, or 
it's called ambiwaska. It has many names. So because, maybe because of that, it, it never really got popular here. It is getting popular here now. Um, but also maybe because of the years of violence and all the... Um, there was not much tourism in Colombia. So when psychedelic tourism was happening in Peru, it was not really happening here in Colombia. So it was overlooked. And that's why when I first started uh, working with the medicine and first started getting the idea and, and the retreat started happening, the first name I gave the, to the retreat was actually Ayahuasca in Colombia. So our website is still ayahuascaincolombia.com. And uh, I didn't change it even when we rebranded to La Huayra, which has uh, a great meaning as well. I could talk about it. I didn't change it because... Um, when people Google ayahuasca in Colombia, they they find us, and it's pretty great for, you know, for getting uh, customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I'll never lose that uh, uh, URL and or domain. Um, what is the background on the on the new name Loira? Where does that come from? So Loira is uh, I don't know if you can see on my T-shirt, but it's the um, it's the it's tool like that. Sh uh, it looks like a flower, yeah, but it's it's a tool that shaman use uses. It's actually mm. a branch, a branch of leaves. It's several plants collected together in a branch, and it's um, it's it's a tool they use to move the energies. But waira or lawaira also means air and wind in their indigenous languages in the Ke in the Quechua language group. So it's a pretty pretty big name, and it's. Uh, uh, the reason we also wanted to rename ourselves, it's kind of complicated when somebody says, oh, I went to Ayahuasca in Colombia, and it's like, but which retreat you, you went to? Well, it's Ayahuasca in Colombia. It's a, it's a little in uh, indirect and imprecise. Yeah, true. Um, well, it's a, it's a good name then with good significant meaning, and the website is still great, and when you, you Google it, it still shows up if you type in the Wira. Um, so it's, mm -hmm. I think it's working out for everybody. The would you ever would you ever uh, build one like a retreat in the United States, or you think like a, a part of it's just the whole environment of going to South America? Uh, I it was I mean, legal. If it if it ever gets legal, I could uh, I could um, think about it. Yeah, why not? Just uh, setting up a, another team and a good shaman uh, and good medicine. It it can be done in the U.S. as well. It's just that. It's illegal and bringing medicine is illegal. Like, and it seems kind of unfair to have to hide your medicine while, you know, alcohol is sold in stores uh, without any limitations. And that really kills people. It just feels unfair, I guess. As of now, here in Colombia, ayahuasca is legal. It's traditional. It also grows here. I think for somebody who really wants to take it seriously, even getting out of the U.S. to drink ayahuasca will be therapeutic as well. Because uh, not to sort of sound like I'm, I don't like U.S., but at the moment it's a pretty toxic place. And uh, getting out of there and just seeing how other people live, uh, how, for example, how Colombians are so happy with so little, is is uh, therapeutic in itself. And then you go back to U.S. with a new mentality and a new sense of well-being. So yeah, the, um, what what whatever you'll miss on the on the whatever you whatever money you spend whatever extra money you spend on the flight tickets, you'll save them on the retreat prices and everything else. Uh, if you want to travel in Colombia afterwards as well, it's a pretty affordable place and it's very safe now. It's much safer than many big uh, cities in the U.S. For example, Medellin used to be like a murder capital, but now there's many big U.S. cities that are above it in the list. Yeah, and I imagine uh, businesses and retreats like yours will be a stabilizing effect because you'll be employing people from that community as well, and then more people have jobs, less likely they're to murder each other, I, I would guess. Definitely. The, the economy has been improving as well. COVID was a bit of a uh, pushback, uh, but generally it, you can see how it gets better. Um uh, Almost, you know, if you went to Medellin five years ago and you come here now, you'll see the difference. And yeah, it's uh, the the work we do as well, and the fact that we attract uh, many foreigners and the money sort of sips through and goes to indigenous communities as well, and and the locals here, like our kitchen ladies, you know, 
when people give them tips, they, they're really surprised and happy because mm -hmm. there's not much tipping culture here in, in Colombia. Yeah, it's a very American thing. But you're you're originally from Latvia, though. Um, mm -hmm. What What's that journey like from growing up? In, I, I don't know, maybe being born there, growing up somewhere else or whatever, but how do you go from Latvia to Colombia? A long story, but um, I was born, I was actually born in Soviet Union. So my first three years, I guess, were in Soviet Union. Then mm. uh, Soviet That's Union fell time. apart. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, uh, I guess, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, I don't remember much of it. But uh, mm. then uh, I grew up in Latvia and I, I never really worked in Latvia because I was working in offshore and gas. Uh, so I would always work on platforms at sea or, or ships. And uh, I, I never really liked my work too much. I did it mostly for money, so I wasn't really happy. And about seven years ago, I got uh, a little tired and I quit my job, quit my relationship, and I went uh, on a one-year uh, trip around South America, which uh, just so happened to be started in Colombia. And I spent three months in, in Colombia, two months in Peru one month in Ecuador, then went back to Europe to work a little more. And when it came time for me to go back to South America, I realized that the further away I went from the Medellin area, the less I liked it. So I just came back here. And uh, for a few years, I lived half a year here and half a year in Europe till eventually I just settled here. It's uh, uh, I just love it here so much. Uh, as, as I mentioned already, people are much nicer, much happier. The weather is great. the 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 prices are really affordable, and uh, it just feels, as opposed to Europe, Europe feels like it's kind of like an aging, sort of tired, angry, old person, and South America feels like a young, sort of thriving, you know, not rich but uh, with good potential kind of place, and that's why that's that's what brought me here, and. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because, you know, English is my third language and Spanish is my fourth language. So it's like I, I sort of rediscovered myself completely and had to start a business in a different culture, a different language, and learn a lot. But uh, it's it's been it's been really exciting. Uh, and uh, as as opposed to my previous lifestyle, you know, I made a lot of money working in offshore and gas, but I was really miserable. And now I'm sort of not really making much money but i'm pretty happy uh and uh, a lot of grateful people and a lot of learning and and it's uh when you work in this field it's also it feels like i did not just create an ayahuasca retreat for people i also created it for myself because you're in this healing container and you can never really uh escape your own healing as life happens and it pushes you down and then you use the the tools you provide to other people to go go back up and you know can continuously get better and it's a lifelong pursuit yeah do you do you have to do anything to in america i think you have to have like a worker's permit or something or a visa of some kind do you have to do anything like that to stay in colombia for a long period of time no in the beginning i had the student visa as in somebody trying to learn spanish then when uh, obviously now i have a family so it gives me a residency and uh, so I never had the work permit, but uh, I guess uh, it's enough. You, if you're if you're a business owner, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the uh, I was just thinking the what would. I wonder how many people are now going to move to Colombia, um, especially if it sounds like. But we had another person recently who's on I think the east side of Colombia, and they're doing um, uh, stuff to basically incentivize farmers to instead of chopping down for us to you know work with them like ecotourism and stuff like that and mm -hmm. apparently uh, columbia is a great opportunity because of the civil wars and stuff and the mass unrest because uh things are cost effective for people who are well-meaning to come in when it's still kind of mm -hmm. like stabilizing uh and so by the time it's like completely stabilized and there's like people with bigger pockets and maybe care less like they won't be able to get mm -hmm. in as much so they make it be like a nice healing thing um, which would be pretty cool to, to see play out um, I do I do believe Colombia has a lot of opportunities. It's the place that, as I said, climate-wise, it's, it's like a paradise. And it's very abundant with water. It has gas, oil, uh, forests, lots of food. 
lots of great people. What it's what it's sort of lacking is, uh, you know, uh, some discipline because Colombian people, as as all Latinos, they're really happy, but they like to, they like to postpone things to tomorrow. You know, famous, uh, infamous, mañana, mañana, and uh, I guess that that's that's the beauty of um, let's say somebody from the West coming with a bit of more discipline and some knowledge about certain businesses and starting them here and growing local community. I'm very optimistic on Colombia. I hope I'm not wrong because I placed all my bets, like uh, put all my eggs in this basket. But I believe that it just it deserves so much love. It's so, so overlooked. So if, if you never went, definitely come over just to see the culture. Another side that Colombia has and that's that has mostly to do with uh, for single men for single men it's uh, the the women are very beautiful so um, I must admit it was one of the reasons why I stayed here you know my wife is Colombian mm -hmm. yeah I think uh, I mean that's a, as good of a incentive as anything you know uh, come for the women stay for the ayahuasca um, I like to say um, some people that that come to Colombia for wrong reasons, like cocaine mm -hmm. and prostitution. Unfortunately, I would like to rebrand Colombia from bad drugs to good drugs and come for cocaine, stay for ayahuasca. Because people, for example, a lot of veterans, they come for that. And that's because mm -hmm. they're in pain. They're running away from their pain through the addiction to drugs. If I could somehow uh, redirect them to ayahuasca, then they might um, get the actual long-lasting healing. But it's a it's a sort of dream of mine. I'm like, um, if I ever could, I would like to be the opposite of Pablo Escobar, uh, which is kind of changed the reputation. Of course, I, I won't be alone. There's there's a lot of other retreat operators here, and it's it's a growing industry, and it's 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 great. It's um, this country really deserves a different brand. Yeah, I think the you guys also have hippos from the Pablo guy. You had hippos oh, or yeah. something. Now, you, now uh, they're like eating it up and living large. Like there's a nice, yeah. sizable hippo population. Yeah, I went to see that place. It's called Hacienda Napolis. It's where Pablo had his ranch, and he brought two hippos, and then they started populating, and ran away to this big river, which just so happened to be is like perfect ambience for hippos, and they just started reproducing. This guy is like he's he's definitely was a really bad guy, but he was definitely a personality because, like, you know, if if today humans would disappear, you know, thousand years from now, <laughs> South America would be full of hippos, and it's just because of this one guy. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Oh, I'm, I imagine with uh, enough time, genetic bottleneck would pro it's probably going to kill the hippos, but they're, they're probably going to because it's from two. Eventually, they'll probably get to the point where they can't breed. There was an island of woolly mammoths that were alive when the pyramids were being made. And uh, the last few of them, they did like genetic testing and stuff, and they were all like horribly inbred, like, and that's what was killing them more than anything. So, but yeah, I, at the well, same time, you know, it'd be nice if they survived. Well, so far, they don't seem to have any problems. Like, it, it seems to not be a problem with some animals, like pigs, for example. They mm. don't seem to get easily inbred. Uh, I don't know much about genetics, but I do wish Colombian hippos well. Uh, they are a bit of a problem because they eat like local fishermen. <laughs> they're really aggressive. Yeah, they're it's, just, it's it's a very funny story that, that whole yeah. hippo thing. Yeah, hippos kill more people than sharks, and most other things. Hippos yeah. are they're they're like imagine like the biggest roided out jock guy just just looking at everyone around him. And you walked near them, and you bumped them. Like that's like hippos. Just and you didn't even yeah. bump them. They're just they're just angry at you. I think even cows kill more people than sharks. But I think hippos are like literally number one or two on the list, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, no, it, they're they're. Yeah. It's like it, you would think they like it, like they like the taste of them or something, like uh, of humans, like that. How how high it is, and I don't think they do. I think they just like you're in my way. I don't like you. No, they don't eat you. I think I believe they just drown you and bite you in in half. But they eat like watermelons and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're friendly at the zoos. Um, are there? You should give you them mentioned... ayahuasca. We could see what that work. I don't know if like you probably have to get a lot for it to work on a hippo. Yeah, they're like no, way two stuns. You can give ayahuasca to to animals. 
you know, uh, one of the legends is the, the the indigenous people found ayahuasca because they saw jaguars eating the vine and uh, feeling something. So it's it's one of the stories. But uh, you can give ayahuasca to, to dogs, uh, but not cats. That's that's all I know. That's uh, that's kind of eccentric how it works for some and not the others. Um, mm. Is there? You mentioned earlier that there are aspects of your business that. Um, not like you're struggling with or that you're you're thinking of uh working on as the future grows what are some of those things is there anything you need help with maybe someone listen in to like throw some ideas your way or whatever um is there it sounds like it's the parallelism like you need more like teams so you can do more um and preserve your downtime but what are some of those uh problems that you're going with or going through or you expect to be going through that uh, maybe someone listening can help with my biggest problem is uh my limited uh, time because every, I just run everything from mm. customer service to, you know, all the building projects that we have now. Like we're building those nice cabins. We finished the first floor and uh, receiving people and facilitation. I just need a team of people. And uh, I'm my, my plan of doing it is uh, we have volunteer program and I'm choosing some good people from volunteers to eventually become part of a team but it's a long process it's it's really hard to find somebody who not only wants to help people but is also smart and wants to dedicate themselves to the subject because as you know there's not a lot of money in it and um, somebody who also doesn't have too much ego because the biggest problem we face is people coming over and drinking ayahuasca for two months and wanting to become shamans and wanting some big titles and attention from people and giving wrong advice just for the sake of giving advice it is it is difficult there's a lot of good people don't get me wrong so uh yeah that's 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 my biggest problem money as well more money would be nice <laughs> because it's uh it's difficult to try and charge less while building a business but it's it's a problem i'm gonna solve i'm sure and um but yeah it's it's a program it's a it's a it's a thing in progress and we I just want to I, w I would like people to know that La Waira is not just an ayahuasca retreat what we're building eventually is a community the idea is that people come for ayahuasca but stay for the community or the tribe we'll have people living here medium to long term and uh getting um you know we we, we have a gym we're gonna have a a co-working space and a lot of place to live uh and you can come here drink ayahuasca get a little better work online uh be in the nature be with other people do yoga every day meditate spend nights by the fire it's it's the kind of eventual goal that we're going going to and uh the concept that we're building and hopefully once we do that then maybe we can open another center and you know eventually have um uh big effect on on more people you know the more the the more the better because the world really needs it yeah i was thinking that uh i know you want to keep the prices low but you could you could keep the price at what it is and then offer like you're saying like you know like they call it like basic and then like premium or something so it's like a higher price but then they get a lot more stuff like you're talking about and that way um i mean if you already have a lot of people usually raising prices will decrease the number of people but since you already have the basic ones it's like no matter what people can come um that might mm -hmm. account for it. but it sounds like that's kind of the, the avenue you're going down by having all these um side things that you can um uh, appreciate while you're there too so mm -hmm. then you'd have more money coming in but maybe someone in listening if you have any ideas if you ever built a retreat or anything like that definitely leave a comment or let me know and i'll send it to sam also his links will be in the show notes as well so you could just uh dm him directly um are there any are there any books that you read or that uh, you've enjoyed reading over the years that you recommend we, we check out people who want to learn more about the subject or just in general? Let, let me check my my Audible app and I'll give you the list because um, I don't read uh, I listen. Mm. It's, the, it's the best way. One I'm what I'm listening to right now really awesome book Why Buddhism is True by Robert Wright. Um, the hard thing about hard things that's about uh business really good book as well uh can i swear on your show yeah you can do whatever you want uh the subtle art of not giving a fuck pretty good book in the realm of hungry ghosts by gabor mate 
The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, Myth of Normal, once again, by Gabor Maté, uh, Principles of Dealing with Changing World Order, that doesn't have anything to do with uh, psychedelics, but it's a, it's a pretty great book about understanding the times we're going through right now. It Didn't Start With You by Mark Volen, an amazing book on uh, trauma and intergenerational trauma, truly amazing, will change your perspective. Uh, Celestine prophecy. Uh, it's not. It's not like. A, uh, basically, it's it's like a story about a lot of synchronicities, which is kind of interesting because it does happen in real life. Running on empty, by Kristin Musello, also about trauma. Uh, How to change your mind by Michael Pollan. Really great book on psychedelics in general. Story of it and you know all this LSD times and. And uh, Psychedelics and Psychotherapy by Team Reed. That's my list. So I should keep everyone uh, busy for a while. There are several on there, if not 80% of them that I haven't read, and now I have more to read, so I appreciate that. Um, I just want to thank you, Sam, for coming on the show today. The links to everything of, of yours will be in the show notes as well. Um, so thanks for uh, taking the time to get people more knowledgeable in ayahuasca, potentially helping with mental illness, and letting people see that there's some really great stuff going on in Columbia, which is Pretty great, as you said, you know, it definitely needs a little bit of rebranding. Yeah, I appreciate uh, the invitation. It was a great conversation, Lowell, so thank you for having me. And, um, you know, you're invited to LaWire as well. Maybe we can do next podcast uh, one-on-one with uh, those nice uh, road mics that, that you liked so mm -hmm. much. 